Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry for that uh, delay. Um, I'd like to talk about getting Python to learn from only uh, parts of uh, your data. My name is uh, Ami, and I work at uh, Final, a uh, financial algorithms company from uh, Israel. So uh, what does this uh, talk about? Um, as time goes by, we can see two trends that pertain to this talk. The first has to do with uh, computing in, in general. Increasingly, we're using uh, computers to do all sorts of tasks that we humans uh, used to do, but, but without our human failings, which means that uh, all sorts of tasks that once would require a human to concentrate an inordinately uh, long uh, time ca can increasingly be done very fast by, by a computer. And the second uh, trend has to do with uh, Python and other high-level uh, scripting languages in general. Um, I think that they tend uh, to, to lower the bar to just uh, playing around with things, right? So, for example, uh, suppose we'd like to try our, out our hand at uh, web uh, development. Then uh, we don't need to read every possible uh, book uh, written on uh, Django before we, we just start uh, playing with it. I mean, these books are probably great if you want to become an expert in it, but, but just to start uh, playing out with stuff, you just need a tutorial and some examples and stuff. So if we look at uh, these two trends in the context of uh, scientific uh, Python, then they pose uh, both, uh, both a challenge, but they provide opportunities as, as well. And let's see how, and I'll uh, start off with, uh, with a challenge. So let's say the flip side of what I said before. Suppose now that, that we're accomplished uh, web, uh, web, develop, uh, web application developers, and we'd like to try out our hand at, at some uh, data mining. So let's say we built a few websites, and uh, now we uh, put into a table all sorts of uh, characteristics of the websites uh, we've built. Uh, the number of clicks uh, needed until, uh, until the customer purchases something, and uh, the, the average time to load a page, and, and the revenue generated by, by the website. And it seems to us that we see uh, some pattern, right? That the fewer clicks are needed and the faster page uh, loads, uh, the pages uh, load, then, then the more money the website is bringing in. So that's great, but we want to quantify it using uh, uh, SciPy. We'd like to build a, a specific model. But uh, uh, the problem is that uh, the problem is that uh, uh, which uh, uh, sci-fi library should uh, we use? I'd like to apologize, by the way. It looks like the screen is is cutting off uh, some of the bottom of my uh, presentation. Um, so the the problem is that sci-fi just offers us uh, so many uh, libraries. Uh, we uh, we can do polynomial fits or linear regression or random forest and all sorts of things and. There's probably no way that we can be an expert in, in each and every uh, uh, single one. So, so how can we know which uh, model to, to apply? And uh, uh, the opportunity we have uh, uh, has to do with uh, model assessment. So let's, let's continue uh, pretending, or maybe not, that, that we're accomplished uh, web developers. And we hear about the, the great XYZ framework, which can process uh, transactions very, very quickly. It's, it's supposed to process some very complicated transaction in less than two and a half milliseconds. So we get access to uh, 30 websites uh, running it, and, and we, uh, plot, we put here in the table the 30 numbers we get of how, how much time it takes. And, and uh, uh, statistics, which was developed uh, before computers, has closed form, uh, formulas for the mean and the standard uh, deviation. So, so it means that we can very easily say, say that, that the XYZ uh, framework probably tra uh, uh, processes transactions somewhere between uh, 1.89 and 4.63 milliseconds. But if you look at the numbers here, then you can see that some of the numbers are very low and some of them are very high. And in, particularly, in particular, the very high numbers might be affecting uh, the mean. So we might not want to apply these, these closed form formulas here, even though they're very easy to use, they just might not be applicable. Um, so instead, we might want to use something like, like uh, the median or the, or the middle value, which is more uh, robust. The problem is that without intense computational uh, power, there's no way to find a confidence interval for stuff like the median. But on the other hand, we, we have all of this computational power at our disposal uh, nowadays. So we really shouldn't be limiting ourselves to use uh, uh, pre-computer uh, uh, statistics only. So these two problems uh, might look uh, uh, different, but they're solved by a common approach, which is getting Python to learn from only parts of uh, your data. And I'd like to show uh, how. Uh, since this is a, Pyth a PyCon uh, talk, then, then the focus will be on uh, Python. There will be no uh, math or formulas. Instead, there will be short code snippets uh, showing how to actually use this stuff. Okay, so on to the challenge of uh, model selection and its uh, solution. 
Let's go back for a moment to, to high school physics lab, uh, specifically the experiments where we measure how much weight we need to apply to a spring in, in order to lengthen it, okay? So th this is stuff we all probably did in, in high school. Uh, um, and Hooke's law says that the force or F is equal to, is proportional to the displacement or X, which means that if uh, we need uh, to put one gram in order to lengthen the, sp uh, the spring by one centimeter, then then we uh, need to put two grams in order to lengthen it by, by two centimeters. And I'm sure the previous speaker knows, knows a lot more about that than, than I do. Uh, so uh, let's now simulate the, the physical experiment now in, in Python. We're not uh, actually going to hang on weights on uh, springs. So it looks like this. Uh, first, I'm uh, going to import some, some stuff from NumPy and, and SciPy and, and some plotting libraries. And the experiment looks like this. I'm, I'm writing x equals a range 1 to 8, which means that x th gets the points 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 8. Th those are the distances we want the spring to lengthen. And f equals uh, x, the, the distance we want to lengthen it. That's the force we need to apply, plus some uh, normally distributed uh, noise. Why? Because in the real world, uh, we can't measure things uh, precisely. There's always uh, some uh, noise uh, involved. And uh, in Python, this is what the experiment now looks like. And let's uh, plot to see what it looks like. So we have these uh, eight points, right? The, ver the horizontal axis is, is the length of the spring. And the, vert uh, the vertical axis is the, the force we need to apply. And these eight points uh, uh, form uh, something that is not quite a, a straight line because of uh, measurement errors, but, but it's quite close enough. Uh, in fact, here's the theoretical line that we're expecting. But of course, our job in, in uh, this uh, lab is to figure out this line for ourselves, right? So the question is uh, whether SciPy gives us uh, anything that, that can get eight points and try to plot a, a line that goes nicely through, through them as well as possible. And indeed, there is such a function. It's, it's polyfit, polynomial fit. So let's see uh, the help on it. So what it does is it takes uh, three parameters, uh, x and y, specifying data and uh, degree. And the degree specifies uh, what uh, degree of polynomial we want to pass uh, through it. So if we write, let's say, x, y, 1, then we're trying to pass a straight line. And if we write x, y, 2, then we're trying to uh, fit a parabola, OK? And now uh, this function looks uh, good enough for our needs. In, in fact, it is. And, and let's see how to use it, OK? So again, x equals a range uh, 1 to 8. And, and f, the force we need to apply, is basically just the length uh, plus uh, some noise. And now I'm going to call uh, uh, polyfit x, f, 1, which means I want to match the point specified by x and f to uh, a straight line. And uh, SciPy is very happy to spit, to spit out the coefficients 1.13 and minus 0 0.23, which means that it thinks that the line is f equals 1.13x minus 0 0.23. This is the line it thinks. So this is very good. Uh, the, the line it, it fits to the data, even with all the noise, is not very different than the actual uh, line. And at this point, uh, we're very pleased uh, with uh, SciPy. The only problem with uh, this example is that it's cheating, right? Why is it uh, cheating? Because uh, you can notice that, that I've written that I'd like to fit x and f to a one degree polynomial. And how do I know at this point that what I want to fit at all is a straight line? Maybe I want a, pa a parabola or something more complicated. And if you remember the introduction, the, the type of stuff we run into in the real world is uh, give me the best model that describes the relationship between the number of clicks and the load time to the revenue generated by the site. We, we usually in real life don't know the model in advance. So uh, let's see what would happen, for example, if we would ask uh, SciPy to fit our spring experiment not to a straight line, but rather to a parabola. So, so here on the bottom right, I'm writing that, uh, that I'd like it to print a polyfit of XF2, meaning try to fit it into a par parabola. And, and SciPy is very happy to oblige us. It, it doesn't care what, what we ask it uh, to do. So let's see what the plots uh, look like. Um, uh, here is uh, the, the plot that I do want, except I don't know it at this point, where, where I'm asking to fit it to a straight line. And uh, here is the plot when I ask to fit it into a parabola. And here they are uh, side by side. The upper left is, is the straight line, and the bottom right is the parabola. And uh, apparently it looks like the parabola fits the train uh, data better, right? So how can we look at the data and, and say, uh, it's great that this function is so flexible, but, but I don't need a parabola. I need something uh, very simple. So if we'd ask a physicist, he'd say, well, since, uh, the, since the straight line is the true model, then if we would train uh, the data only from eight points, like we see in the shaded area in the top left uh, corner, and ask it to fit it to a straight line, and then test it on the ninth point, and, and look at the uh, 
test error on the ninth point, which is illustrated by that, by that red box there, uh, versus the case on the bottom uh, right where we would use the first eight points, uh, where we would use our eight points to generate a model and then use, uh, and then uh, after we built the model, try, try to see its error on the ninth point, then the error given by the true model would be less than the error given by, by a model that's completely wrong and just tends to fit the data better, right? But of course, uh, the problem is that at some point we need to say, this is our data, we need to build a model now. So we have our eight points and, and that's it. We need, we need to build a model at this point. So this leads to the first application of, of getting Python to learn from only parts of your data, which is uh, when you have a few models that, that and you need to decide which one of them fits your uh, uh, data the best. Or uh, conversely, if, it ha if your models are parameterized and, and you don't know which uh, parameters to choose, then you should uh, take uh, the uh, train data and leave out some of uh, the points and, and train the model only on parts of the data. And then uh, check to see for each one of the model how it's doing on the points uh, you left out. So I'm going to show here a, a very simple but, but effective uh, technique uh, called uh, cross-validation that does that. So here we have our eight, the eight points we did in the lab again, but what we're doing for both the, the straight line on the upper left and the parabola on the bottom right is we're training it only using the first five points. We're not, we're not using all the points we can. And once we've built the model, we, we assess the error on the last uh, three points. And it's apparent that, that the straight line is doing much better than the parabola. But we don't stop only there. We, we also leave out the uh, indices uh, one and two Train, all, uh, train both the straight line and the parabola on the stuff that we left out and see the, the errors of both of these models. And here the linear model is, is losing out, but not by much. And finally, we can uh, leave out all of the points except the, the first two and, and do the same. Okay, so this is known as cross-validation. So altogether, you can see that there are six, uh, six models built here, right? On the upper left, we have uh, the three models built for the linear line, and on the bottom uh, right, we have the three models uh, built for the parabola. And the way to decide which model works uh, best for us is, is to take the average or the sum or, or anything like that. And, uh, and in this case, the, the model we really want, which is the straight line, will come out as having a, a lower error, cross-validated error than, than the wrong model. Okay, so now let's see how to use it uh, in, in Python. So first of all, we need uh, to, to import the cross-validation uh, model. And uh, one of the things that the cross-validation uh, uh, cross uh, model supplies, among other things, is the ability to iterate train and test indices over some uh, uh, cross-validation. So for example, if we ask uh, it to iterate the train indices and the test indices for a cross-validation corresponding to a data set of size eight, which is what we have here, then it'll spit out three pairs of, of indices exactly corresponding to what I've seen before, right? So the first of these pairs will say, let's say that that the train ind indices are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and it's leaving out the, for the test indices 5, 6, and, and 7. Okay, now uh, we need to write for ourselves uh, two functions. I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, rectangle is not aligned. Uh, the first one of them is a build model, which takes a, a train X and train F specifying the train data. And uh, the second function is, is find error, which takes a model and uh, test X and test F, which, uh, which specify the test data. And what the second function does is evaluate how our model is doing on the test uh, data. And now that we have both these things, let's connect them together. And to find uh, the, the cross-validated error of, of a model, what we do is we first initialize uh, error to zero. Then we ask the cross-validation uh, model to iterate both the train and the test indices over the cross-validation uh, corresponding to the size of our data set, which in this case is eight, because we have eight points. And then for each uh, such a combination, we build a model uh, uh, using only the train data. And once we have this uh, model, we uh, find uh, its performance on the test data using the test indices and add uh, the error to the total error. And once, uh, once this loop uh, terminates, then we have uh, the cross-validated error of this model and we can compare it to that of other models and, and see which one of them uh, works uh, best. Okay, so that was one application. The other one uh, has to do with, uh, with the opportunities presented to us by all of this uh, computing power. Uh, so let's recall the example from the introduction. Uh, again, uh, what we have is uh, uh, some promise that the XYZ uh, framework uh, is really excellent. It, excellent, it has great processing time. 
and we've collected uh, its processing time from 30 websites, okay? So, so let's see it in code. Uh, T equals uh, uh, a list of, of length of 30. On one website, it did it in 1.71, and the second one in 2.55, and so on. And we'd like to find uh, the typical value. How long does, does it typically take the XYZ uh, framework to uh, process uh, the data? So let's look at it uh, graphically. Uh, instead of using a formula. So this is how uh, the data looks uh, in, no particular, in no particular order on the uh, horizontal axis. And uh, since uh, the, the mean and the standard deviation have, uh, have a closed form uh, formulas, then, then it's uh, very easy to apply it and to obtain the mean, which is somewhere along uh, there, right? But, uh, and moreover, since we have a formula for the standard deviation, then it's easy to say that the mean is probably no more than 0 0.7 away from, from this green line over there. But can anyone see a problem with this, with this picture? Right, exactly. It, it looks like the mean is, is affected by these three very high points, right? They might be skewing, skewing everything. So in this case, we might consider some, some alternative statistic, which is uh, more robust. Uh, I'm going to show here the, the trimmed mean. So the trimmed mean uh, works as follows. First, we build a band, a grade band around uh, the 24 points consisting of, of all of the points that are not the three highest points and the three lowest points, okay? And, and once we've selected these uh, 24 points, um, then we can uh, calculate the, the mean only of the points in the band, and that's uh, the, the trimmed uh, mean, okay? And, and if we draw both the mean and the trimmed uh, mean, then, then we can see that the trimmed mean is significantly lower than, than the one above. And it seems to be ha handling the outliers better, better right? The, the blue line here seems to me, seems much better than the green one. So now we, we're on the opposite uh, side of the problem, right? Because we have a method that, that addresses well the problem of the outliers. But the problem is that there's no known uh, closed uh, formula for the confidence inter interval for the trimmed mean. We can't say the trimmed mean is probably uh, 2.27 uh, plus minus uh, 0.5. We just don't know that, okay? So, um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry for the appearance of, uh, of the numbers, uh, but uh, what I'd like to show you is uh, the following. Um, if we would have access to an unlimited uh, number of uh, websites running the XYZ framework, then there really wouldn't be a problem, right? Because what we could do is uh, we could take uh, uh, the first 30 websites, write, o write the results over there, and, and in the uh, uh, green uh, rectangle on the right, write the <coughs> trimmed mean for them. And then we take uh, the next uh, 30 uh, websites and write the results, calculate the trimmed mean, and, and write it again in a rectangle on the right. And we do it uh, another time, and, and we do it many, many times, actually. And once we had all these results for the trimmed uh, mean, then we could uh, just retain those, those blue-green uh, uh, rectangles with the results, right? And, and out of them, we could uh, build a, a histogram. And from this histogram, we could evaluate stuff. We could say with 95% probability, the the trimmed mean is probably no less than one and, and no more than, than five, right? But of course the problem is that we don't have access to, to an unlimited number of, uh, of websites in reality. We, we just have 30, for, for example. So this leads to the second application of, of the idea of getting Python to learn from only parts of your data. We can build artificial uh, data sets from the original data sets by, by a technique called uh, bootstrapping. And it works as follows. Here on the top, we have the original uh, 30 results. Now, now we build another, another data set as follows. We sample uh, with replacement, which means that, that we pick a certain number randomly, copy it uh, below, uh, but retain uh, it above. And we do so again, we select a number, and uh, uh, we select it again. Uh, since we're sampling uh, with uh, replacement, then uh, inevitably at some point, uh, we'll be uh, uh, sampling uh, the same number we did before. So since some of the numbers can appear on the bottom uh, cloud more than once, then, then some of them don't appear. And only parts of the data appear in this new artificial uh, data set. But nevertheless, we can use this uh, data set uh, to find the trimmed mean for it. And we add it as a new data set, even though it's not. We just created it from the previous one. And in fact, if we repeat this process uh, uh, many, many times, then we have as many data sets as we want, right? And then. Conceptually, we can uh, build uh, the, the histogram and, and say, say what we want about the distribution of the trimmed mean. So it's important to note that, that this is totally infeasible without a powerful computer, right? Because 
uh, uh, we'd want to calculate the trimmed mean here, uh, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 uh, times. It's, it's not possible to do this by, by calculator. But, but now that computers are here, we should be doing stuff like that. So this uh, method, uh, which is called uh, the bootstrap, has interesting uh, statistical properties. It, it's known to work in a wide variety of, of cases. Uh, uh, let's see how it looks now in, in code. So first I'm going to import the statistics model and, and then the bootstrap model. And, and here is the data from before. T equals the list of, of 30 values. And it's very easy to, to ask uh, SciPy to to calculate the mean and the trimmed mean, right? It's, it's basically just uh, functions in English. Uh, print mean and trimmed mean, so it says that the mean is about 3.26 and the trimmed mean is about 2.27. And in fact, uh, finding the, the bootstrap confidence interval is, is just as easy using the CI, or confidence interval function. So what this function does is it takes both a data set and the function that knows to transform a data set into a statistics. And it does uh, what I showed graphically before. It, it does, uh, it builds new data sets by sampling uh, with a replacement. It builds many, many of them. And it calculates the, it applies the statistics to each one of them. And it conceptually builds the histogram and stuff. And, and in the end, it's, it's very simple to use. And, and it tells us that with high probability, the trimmed mean is, is, one point, uh, s is somewhere between 1.76 and, and 3.28. So I think this is uh, really great. I mean, people, uh, people didn't know to do this stuff before, before computers existed. There, there is no formula that, that can do this. Um, OK, so what I tried uh, to, to show here today, that, that there are uh, two trends of uh, computers being more prevalent and, and of Python making our life easier and, and making it easy just to hack and play around with stuff, even if we're not experts in every possible field, which, which we can't be anyway. Uh, on the one hand, it's very hard to, given all the possibilities, to choose which is the correct model we want to use. And on the other hand, we have all of this computing uh, power and we shouldn't just be using the statistics we learned in, in high school or college. Um, so the way to address uh, both of uh, these things is, I think, getting Python to learn from only parts of uh, your data. So the cross-validation model addresses uh, the first uh, problem and uh, the bootstrap uh, method addresses uh, the second problem. So I'd like to thank you uh, for your time and, and also uh, to thank the organizers of the conference. Yes, yes. Uh, while getting some data from the web, uh, the part of the data might be missing. So can you share your experience about dealing with the missing data? Oh, you're, you're talking about, uh, okay, you're talking about missing data in a different sense. Like suppose you have uh, uh, questionnaires of, uh, like pe people filled out questionnaires and, and, s and some people didn't answer some, uh, some questions. Yeah. Right, so that, that's a very, very interesting uh, topic in, in machine learning, but, but it's, uh, it, it, it uh, doesn't have uh, a lot in common with uh, this, this talk. I'll, I'll be very happy to discuss it with you later if you want, but. But this isn't what, what this talk is concerned. That, that's a huge, huge field uh, just, just in itself, how to deal with missing data. It actually has to do with a specific uh, uh, type of model uh, you're trying to build. Different models have different approaches. So uh, I have a question. So what is the complexity for computing a, uh, the, the confidence interval for trim mean? What is the what, please? Complexity, uh, time complexity or, or the storage complexity. Oh, uh, well, the, the storage is, um, is basically, I think, unlimited because we just need one number saying what the trend mean was for each. And, and as far as time goes, it, it is very tr uh, time consuming because uh, just finding the band uh, that contains the elements of the trimmed uh, mean is, is linear time and the average is linear time and, and we need to do it uh, thousands and thousands of times. So if you have a massive uh, data set of, of gigabytes, then, then it, will take, uh, it will take time. This is a very computa computationally intense uh, techniques and, and as far as I know, there aren't, there aren't very significant uh, shortcuts for, for it. You do need powerful uh, computers. Uh, any any question? If there are no questions, uh, we are going to uh, thank uh, Dr. Terry one, one, one more time. Yes, sir. And uh, so you can go to the lunch for uh, this lunch time now. <laughs> <laughs>